Take your Bible this morning for our scripture reading. Do Hebrews chapter 9, please. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to read verses 11 through 15 of Hebrews chapter 9. Reading the verses responsibly, we'll begin together on verse 11, and I'll read 12 together on 13. We'll alternate until we end together reading verse 15 of Hebrews chapter 9. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. Let's begin on verse 11 of Hebrews chapter 9. Ready? But Christ, being come an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. 
For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, and by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing to the reading of the Scripture here this morning. I want to thank you, Lord, already for the wonderful music we've, had, we've heard today and we've been able to sing today. Lord, thank you for the good spirit that's here this morning, and thank you for each one that's made their way to the service. And Father, as we prepare now to listen to your word and the truth you have for us today, I pray you'd help us to listen carefully to the special as it's sung and that it would put our heart in tune with your heart and that you would give us all ears to hear what you want to say to each of us today. It's in Christ's name I ask it. Amen. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Let not your heart be troubled, his tender word I hear, and resting on his goodness, I lose my doubts and my fears. Though by the path he leadeth, but one step I may see, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Me, I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds arise, when songs give place to sighing, when hope within me dies, I draw the closer to him. From care he sets me free, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he cares for me. His eye is on that sparrow, and I know he cares for me. I sing because I'm happy, I sing because I'm free, for his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Now, we thank you, our Father, for the privilege to be here this morning, and thank you, Lord, for watching over us. And Surely, Lord, if your eye is on the sparrow, as you say in your word, surely you watch over us. And I pray you'd watch over us this morning 
as we open up your word together. Lord, I pray that you would help me as I bring the message to be clear, help it to be understandable, help it to be helpful and challenging to each of us this morning. Lord, as we value and understand just what it means when we say nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so, Lord, I pray you'll help each one as they listen and help me as I bring this lesson today. And I pray that your will will be accomplished in each heart and life. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The days were long and the nights were filled with nursing sore muscles and trying to reassure one another that hope wasn't lost. That God one day was going to replace their sorrow with celebration. You see, their days were filled with the sound of a whip cracking on somebody's back, being bossed around and yelled at, forced labor. The nights were spent feeding their families, spending time with children, nursing wounds inflicted from the hands of the overseers. In fact, they called them slave drivers. You see, they've been held captive for so long, none of them even remotely remembered what freedom felt like. And yet, the hope of being delivered never faded from their heart. Generation after generation had taken their place in Pharaoh's pits, mashing mud, water, and straw until it became pliable enough to be molded into bricks. Pharaoh would grow angry with them and take away the straw and still command the same amount of bricks to be made. In the evening, the fathers and the mothers would gather their children just before, bread, just before bed to say their prayers with their little ones. They would tell their children that God was one day going to send a deliverer, just as their parents told them. That one day they would be released from their labors and He'd return them to the land that He had promised them. They would tell their children the stories of Abraham and Sarah, how God gave them a son when long after they'd given up any hope that their little nursery would ever be occupied. Then they talk about Isaac and Rebekah and Jacob and Rachel and Leah. But the story they loved to tell their children was that of Joseph and how he was brought into Egypt and put into prison. But God delivered him from that prison and brought him up to be second in command only to Pharaoh. And that one day God in His faithfulness was going to raise up another Joseph, this time a deliverer who would deliver them. And they would pray each night with their children, Lord, send a deliverer so our children will know the gift of freedom. Grant us favor, God, in Your mercy. Forgive us of our sins. In Your love, heal our wounds. And by Your great hand, send a deliverer. You see, they'd been in slavery for more than 400 years. And finally... God did raise up a deliverer. We spoke of him in our Sunday school class today. His name was Moses. God in His providence had him be born there in the land of Egypt. And Moses heard the voice of God saying to him that I've seen the suffering of my people and I've come to deliver them. In fact, Moses, every time he went before Pharaoh, always uttered these words, Let my people go that they may serve me. Plagues begin to trouble the land of Egypt and Pharaoh included. But he wouldn't release the children of Israel. He wouldn't let them go. <coughs> God told Moses, finally there will be just one more plague. And that plague would be the death of the firstborn. And it would be throughout all the land of Egypt and even in the land where the children of Israel were dwelling, the land of Goshen. And so the instructions, I'd like you to turn back to the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible, and look with me at Exodus chapter 12. Would you turn there please? 
Exodus chapter 12. Here's the instructions that the Lord gave to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt. Verse number (coughs) 2. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. Thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord." And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So here's the instruction. Every family would take a male lamb of the first year without blemish, without spot. They would remove him from the herd and care for him until the 14th day of that month. And then in the evening at twilight, they'd kill that lamb and they would catch his blood in a bowl, in a basin. The lamb would be roasted for the family to eat, but the blood was caught. Why? They were to smear that blood on the top post and the two side posts of their doorway. That when the death angel came through the land of Egypt, and he would see the blood on the doorpost, he would pass over that home. And the death angel would not visit that home and take the firstborn from that family. The day would come. The family is busy killing their most prized and precious lamb. The lamb that had was without spot and without blemish. You can imagine probably two million Jews there in the land of Egypt, smearing the blood of the Lamb on the top and the sides of the doorframe of their homes. I can imagine the Egyptians who would see them or would pass by would think, what are those strange people doing now? How odd. How how silly. What what are they believing in at at this time? But after more than 400 years of slavery, they believed God would be true to His Word. And that God would pass over them and deliver them from the land of Egypt. Everything seemed fine. Nobody went to sleep, I'm sure. You wouldn't have and I wouldn't have either. We're waiting for the midnight hour. And as midnight approached, the sky was dark. Darker probably than any midnight sky they'd ever seen. The air had an ominous tone to it. And all of a sudden the death angel begins to sweep down and search out every home throughout all the land of Egypt. From Pharaoh's palace to the smallest little hut in a back alley. Every home throughout all the land of Egypt. The death angel searches them all out. 
At midnight, not one Egyptian home was left untouched by the mighty hand of God. Every single home had experienced the death of their firstborn. God was true to His Word. He did what He promised. But in the house of those Israelites who had the blood applied to the doorposts, there was no crying. There was no death. Their firstborn was safe. The death angel had passed over them when he saw the blood. Can you imagine in the same city the cries of despair, the cries of anguish, the cries of the agony of death mingled with shouts of praise and shouts of victory and hugging and happiness. What a contrast. That night in the land of Egypt. What separated the joy of the Hebrews from the sorrow of the Egyptians? Did the death angel pass over the houses of the Hebrews because they were just more noble than the Egyptians? No, no, that's not the reason. Were the firstborn spared because of the pedigree of the Hebrews? Certainly not. Did they escape because they just lived in a better section of town? No, they did not. Did they pass by the Hebrews because God just liked them better than He did the Egyptians? No. The truth is, the death angel didn't pass over a home because of their pedigree or because of their prominence in the community or because of their popularity among others or even because of the profit margin in their bank account. He only passed over them for one reason. The blood was applied to their doorpost. The blood of the Lamb was applied on the door of their home, and they spared the firstborn of the land. When that death angel came down, he wasn't looking to see what model car was in the driveway. He wasn't, he wasn't coming down to see what, what, whether the house had wonderful curb appeal to it or not. He wasn't coming down to see if there was a plaque of Scripture hanging over the door. He was coming down to see if the blood was on the doorpost. And you might ask, why the blood of the Lamb? I want you to understand something. God, God had already determined before the foundation of the world how He was going to forgive the sins of the world. And so He began there in Exodus by them taking this Lamb and killing the Lamb and sprinkling the blood upon the doorposts. Because God knew one day He would send His only begotten Son into this world. And when Jesus Christ would come on the scene, He had the forerunner of Jesus Christ, John the Baptist, announce on the shores of, of the Jordan River, He would say, listen, here is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And every Jewish boy, listen, even the disciples who had celebrated this Passover, they had killed a lamb every year all of their life. And they had put the blood and they had eaten the lamb and they'd, they'd celebrated the Passover every single year. They knew what the Lamb of God was. And now he says, here's the lamb, not that's going to take away your sin for a year, not just who's going to take away the sin of your family. Here's the Lamb of God that will take away the sin of the world. And it's Jesus Christ. He knew that that blood on the doorpost that day was just a foreshadowing of the blood that Jesus would shed one day for the sins of the world. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. God had said in Deuteronomy 12 and verse 23, He said, Be sure that thou eat not the blood, for the blood is the life, and thou mayest not eat the life of the flesh. God had declared that the life of the flesh is in the blood. Blood is equivalent to life. 
Life is equivalent to God who's the giver of life. Life is precious to God. All life is precious to God. God is not about death. God is about life. The lives of those Hebrews would be spared by the blood of the Lamb. Medically speaking, blood is essential for life. You can live without both of your kidneys because you can go on dialysis. You can live without much of your brain. I won't comment. You can live without much of your liver and your lungs. Doctors can even work on a person's heart and stop the heart for a certain amount of time if he's hooked up, if you're hooked up to a what they call a heart and lung machine. But what man cannot live without is his blood. Medically speaking, life is in the blood, but theologically speaking, eternal life is in the blood of the Lamb. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The redemption that we enjoy today is because of the blood of Jesus Christ. The salvation that we have today is because of the blood of Jesus Christ. The life we have is because of the blood of Jesus Christ. The forgiveness we have is because of the blood of Jesus Christ. The joy we have is because of the blood of Jesus Christ. The deliverance from sin is because of the blood of Jesus Christ. You're here this morning and you're wondering, where do I find the joy of life? Where do I find the salvation that people talk about? Where can I find that satisfaction and healing and hope and deliverance? You're not going to find it in books, my friend. You're not going to find it in education. You're not going to find it by finding your soulmate, the right spouse or the, the, the right, right friend for life. You're not going to find it by just acquiring more things. And let me just get a bigger house and a nicer car and more money in the bank and more clothes and better clothes and more of this and more of that. My friend, there's a trail of blood that flows in the Bible from the book of Revelation all the way through to the book of Genesis. From Genesis to Revelation. It all the way, it's a red thread that began back in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned against God and God had to kill an animal, an innocent animal, shed His blood to cover Adam and Eve with the skin of that animal. And it goes all the way through the cross of Jesus Christ into the Bible says in Revelation, the saints of the tribulation period have their robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. The Bible is a bloody book. Someone said, you cut the Bible anywhere you want, it'll bleed. It'll bleed. <clears throat> From Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation. Jesus shed His blood for you and me. Now I know when I talk about the blood of Christ, people in our society, people in our day and age, they kind of look at that with horror. It's not often anymore you hear anybody preach on the blood of Jesus Christ. That's, that's not too uh, accepted in our cultured society. But that's exactly what the Bible teaches. I know it may not be politically correct, but it is equivalent to eternal life and abundant life. And it must be discussed and it must be preached again today in our pulpits. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Passover was a commemoration of God's deliverance of His people out of Egypt. The Jews always took great care to celebrate and observe Passover. The disciples of Jesus would have seen many Passover lambs slain on the 14th day of the month. 
as a covering for their sins and the sins of the people of God. Jewish people today who have rejected Jesus Christ and do not believe He was the Messiah, they still celebrate that Passover, looking for their Messiah to come, not realizing He has come. That's why the verse we read this morning in Hebrews chapter 9 The Bible says in verse 12, Neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by His own blood, He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living and true God. Jesus, as our high priest, didn't go in carrying a lamb to the altar and kill that lamb. He took himself to the altar. He did, oh, the altar he had was a cross that he carried on his back. And he willingly laid himself down and they nailed him to the cross. My friend, they didn't need the nails. Jesus said, nobody takes my life. I lay it down. He said, Greater love hath this than than, than, hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus said he came to give his life a ransom for all. That what held Jesus to the cross wasn't the nails, it was his love for you and me. And he shed his blood when he died on the cross. That lamb a priest would carry up would only cover the sins of the people. And it would only cover them for a year till the very next April. They'd have to do it all over again. But the Bible says Jesus Christ, when He shed His blood on the cross and He presented His blood to the Savior, that He did it once for all. And our sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. And that we're cleansed from all unrighteousness. We're cleansed from all sin by the blood of Jesus Christ. Let me give you a few thoughts and we'll be done. I want to give you three thoughts and three ways in which Jesus fulfilled the requirements of God for the Lamb to be offered. Number one, Jesus, or the, God said in the Old Testament it had to be a Lamb and Jesus is the Lamb of God. John 1 and verse 29. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Over and over again, John refers to Jesus as the Lamb of God. In Revelation 5, when they can't open the sealed book and they can't find anyone to open the book, he says, wait, there's a Lamb that can open the book. And he refers again to Jesus as the Lamb of God, who's worthy to open the scroll and break its seals. Jesus was slain and His blood was shed to purchase redemption for us. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1 that that we were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from our vain conversation uh, by our forefathers. He said, but we were were, uh, 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 delivered by the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without spot and without blemish. It has nothing to do with what we did. It had nothing to do, just like the Israelites, it had nothing to do with what their income was. It had nothing to do whether they went to the church that Sunday or not. It had nothing to do with whether they had ill will towards the Egyptians or not. It had everything to do whether they applied the blood to the doorposts. My friend, don't let anything else that you might trust in keep you from having the blood applied to your heart or you will not pass over the judgment of God. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Number two, the Lamb was to be without spot or without without blemish. Jesus offered Himself as the perfect Lamb of God. Jesus Christ is the only one that could be the Lamb of God. He's the only one that the Bible says was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. Jesus Christ never sinned. Jesus Christ not only never did something He shouldn't have done, 
He did not do something he should have done. He never thought something he shouldn't have thought. Because the Bible says the thought of foolishness is sin. He never thought something he should have thought. He was in all points tempted just like we are. And yet without sin. He was the spotless, the lamb without blemish and without spot. Peter knew the purity of Jesus. That's why the Holy Spirit had him right. He's of a lamb without blemish and without spot. But you remember when Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him and said, Thou sayest it. Then said Pilate to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. His wife sent word to him, and said, Have thou nothing to do with this just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The wages of sin is death. Jesus Christ, we already stated, was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus Christ had no sin whatsoever. But the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And Jesus goes to the cross on Calvary. And He's nailed there and He hangs in agony. And He suffers and He bleeds and He dies. The wages of sin is death. Jesus Christ pays the wages of sin. Not for His sins, He doesn't have any. Jesus Christ was dying for our sins. Was He dying for the sins of the whole world? Absolutely. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. But my friend, don't be deceived this morning. There are people this morning, if we could peel back the earth and gaze into hell this morning, there's people in hell who believe Jesus died for the sins of the world. Because you're just believing a fact of history. Salvation is not believing Jesus died for the sins of the world. Salvation is believing Jesus Christ died for my sins. That He died in my place. That God demonstrated He commended His love toward me and that while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. It's believing Jesus laid those sins on Himself as the Lamb of God and said, God, punish me instead of Stay in slave law. Or instead of Bob Reed. Put your name there. He died for you. And as He took your death for you, when you receive His payment on your behalf, you receive His eternal life. You receive the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's, that's how you get it. When you receive Jesus as your Savior, when you believe He died on the cross for you, you know what God does? He applies the blood to the doorposts of your heart. And He doesn't have to judge you with the death angel. Because it's the wages of sin, it's death. He sees the blood of Jesus and He passes over you. He doesn't see Baptist written across your doorpost. He doesn't see church written across your doorpost. He doesn't see religious written across your doorpost. He doesn't see I'm not too bad written across your doorpost. He sees the blood of Jesus. That's the only thing that causes Him to pass over you. Or you will have to suffer the wages of sin. Which would be separation from God. That's what death is. Separation from God in a place called hell. The lamb had to be slain and the blood applied to redeem the lives of the Hebrews. We said earlier the death angel didn't take into consideration who was in the house. He was only looking for the blood. The Bible says in Colossians 1, it pleased the Father that in Him, that's Jesus, should all fullness dwell, 
and having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself. Jesus shed His blood. Do you realize He shed His blood several times before He even got to the cross? When He prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible says He prayed so fervently and so hard that He began to sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. In Pilate's hall, after he'd been arrested and gone through several trials, he was brought to Pilate the final time and he had Jesus scourged, beaten with whips. Whips that embedded with bits of glass and bone at the end of those whips. And men, men who were very skilled in using those whips to tear the flesh off the back of the victims. His blood was shed. Then the soldiers mocked him. And they took that crown of thorns with the, the long thorns and shoved it down on his head. And blood flowed down his, down his head. At Calvary, they drove the nails into his hands and his feet. Blood was shed. When they came to the cross and it was normal that they would come after a certain amount of time and break the legs of those who were crucified. The only way that anyone... Crucifixion was a horribly excruciating way to die. The most awful and painful way to die. It was such an awful thing that they wouldn't even mention persecu or, or crucifixion in mixed company. It was a horrible way. You literally died, not only with the suffering and the pain, but you died because you couldn't breathe. You would try to raise yourself up to get enough air to come into your lungs to get one more breath. And so they would push with their bottom feet with that nail and they'd try to push up to get some air. So to, in order to keep that from happening, the soldiers would come by and they would break the legs of those being crucified so they could not raise up and they would expire sooner. But you remember, they break the legs of the thieves that were crucified with Christ. When they came to Jesus, they saw that He was dead already. So they didn't break His legs. But that was, that was fulfillment of prophecy because the Old Testament said, not a bone of Him will be broken. But they didn't break His legs, but they took a spear and they thrust it into His side, didn't they? And what came out? Water and blood. Blood was shed once again. The Bible says that God's looking to and fro, searching the earth for those who are righteous. We, we don't have a real good concept of just how righteous and how holy God really is. None of us would dare stand in His presence and declare ourselves to be righteous. That's why Paul wrote in the book of Romans, there is none righteous, no, not one. Oh, you may be better than the guy sitting across from you. You may be better than the person sitting in front of you or behind you, but you're not being compared to them. You're in the presence of God. You're in the presence of God who the Bible says is light and in Him is no darkness at all. And we find out that when we stand before Him that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the sight of God. That nothing we ever do or ever could do would pass the test of holiness in the sight of God. Why? Because the Bible says there is no forgiveness of sin except by the shedding of blood. It doesn't matter how long you've been in church. It doesn't matter how many times you've been to church. It doesn't matter if you have enough Sunday school pins that drag to the ground. 
It won't matter anything when you stand before God because no amount of Sunday school, no amount of church, no amount of goodness, no amount of your being a nice person can ever take away your sin. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can take away sin. When you stand before God, will you really try to plead your goodness to Him? When He looks over at His Son and you see the nail prints in His hands, you see the scar in His side, you see the nail prints in His feet, will you really try to turn your back on His Son and say, God, I I think I could just do it my way? Do you really think that will pass? God emphatically says it will not. There's only one way for you and me to effectively deal with the eternal ramifications of sin. And that is to come before God and plead the blood of Jesus Christ His Son and to receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. And say, God, you you sent a Savior, you sent your Son, and I receive His sacrifice for me. I receive His righteousness, not my own. Have you come to God that way? When you if you stood before God this morning, what would you plead to enter into heaven? I think I would stand at the gate of heaven and if God would ask, and He doesn't have to because He knows, but if He would ask, I would say nothing but the blood of Jesus. He was born in Philadelphia in 1826. And Robert accepted Christ as his Savior at the age of 17. He later graduated from Bucknell University with high scholastic honors. In the 73 years that he lived here on earth, he pastored churches in Philadelphia, New Jersey, New York, and Brooklyn. Along with his preaching, Robert Lowry also had the gift of music and the writing of hymns. He supplied the music for such familiar hymns as were Marching to Zion. Where is my wandering boy tonight? I need thee every hour. And Fanny Crosby's song, All the way my Savior leads me. He also wrote the words in music. Shall we gather at the river? In 1874, he wrote the hymn, Christ Arose, that we sing around Easter time. But in 1876, he wrote a hymn that would give us the answer to our sin debt. When he wrote this song, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Verse 2, For my pardon, this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And stanza 4 says, This is all my hope and peace, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of 
of Jesus. Father, I pray you'll take the truth this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming and being the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. Thank you for being willing to come and not only die, but shed your blood. That just as those Hebrews applied that blood to their doorposts, we apply your blood to our heart. To the doorposts of our life. And when it comes time to judge us as sinners, you'll see the blood of Jesus and pass over us. Lord, I pray this morning that every single individual in this room, under the sound of my voice, would be able to say, here's my hope of heaven. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, God's Son, that cleanses us from all sin. Lord, put it into each and every heart this morning, as only You can do. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. This morning, just between you and God, I wonder how many folks in the room today would say, Pastor, if I died this morning, if I had the pain go through my chest and I couldn't get my next breath, and I stood before God, I would be able to say to God, nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's what I'm counting on to get me to heaven. Here's my hand as a testimony to that this morning. Would you slip it up for a moment that I may see it? Would you slip it up and say, that's me? Amen. You may put them down. You're here today and would say, Pastor, I, I can't say that for sure. But I'd like to. Would you let me pray for you? I'm not going to embarrass you or call you out, but I will pray for you. And my friend, don't boast yourself of tomorrow. You do not know what a day can bring forth. You can open up the newspaper any day of the week. Go online, look at the obituaries. There are numbers of people in there who didn't expect to be in there. You're here this morning and say, Pastor, to my knowledge, I've never trusted Jesus Christ. And His shed blood for me on the cross, I've never trusted Him as my Savior. But I appreciate if you pray for me this morning. I know God's dealing with my heart. You couldn't raise your hand the first time, you'll raise it now. Just put it up and put it back down and say, Pastor, pray for me this morning. Will you slip it up? Will you put it up? God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Others, you couldn't raise it the first time. You'll raise it this time, will you? Say, Pastor, pray for me today. In a moment, I'm going to pray and we'll have our invitation. Listen very carefully. If you're here today, you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. I'll pray and we'll, in a moment, we'll stand to our feet. The pianist will begin to play. Bob will sing. It's opportunity for you to receive Christ as your Savior today. You know, God says, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. If something in you is saying, not now, put it off. Wait, that's not God. God is always now, today. Don't, don't walk out the door and play Russian roulette with God. You don't know what today will bring forth. Make sure you know Him as your Savior. Maybe you're here this morning, Christian, and there's somebody you're concerned about and someone you know that you need to begin praying for. Maybe somebody you know you need to witness to. Maybe you need to come and pray for them this morning. That you can press upon them the claims of Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God to take away their sin. Whatever it is that God's spoken to your heart about, if you're saved and 
you've never been scripturally baptized, you ought to come and say, Pastor, I'm saved, but I've not been baptized, and I need to obey the Lord in that matter. If you're saved and you're baptized and you believe this is where you ought to belong, then you come and say, Pastor, I'd like to belong to Bible Baptist Church. Whatever it is God has dealt with your heart about today, I want you to obey Him this morning. Heavenly Father, thank You for speaking to our hearts today. Thank You, Lord, for the wonderful, wonderful truth that runs from Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation. The blood of Jesus Christ. The Lamb of God that can take away our sin. I'm praying, Lord, for these who cannot say that today. That you would help them to respond now. And be able to say that as of October 14th, 2018, I know that I have eternal life. And I know my sins are forgiven. The blood has been applied to the doorposts of my heart. I pray, Lord, you'll help them to listen and respond to you this morning. May you help Christians. Help us to be the witnesses we ought to be to friends and loved ones, co-workers, neighbors who need to know their sins have been paid for by Jesus Christ. Have your way in this invitation now. And I'll thank you for it.